Dr. Sage here, continuing our discussion of microbial nutrition and growth. Today we're going to discuss the environmental factors that influence microbes. By the end of this video, you should be able to list and define five terms used to express the temperature-related growth capabilities of microbes, summarize three ways in which microorganisms function in the presence of oxygen, identify three other physical factors that microbes must contend with in the environment, list and describe five major types of microbial associations, and discuss characteristics of biofilms that differentiate them from platonic bacteria and their infections. So, what are some environmental factors that influence microbes? Well, heat, cold, gases, acid, radiation, osmotic pressure, hydrostatic pressure, and other microbes, which we're gonna go through all these in the video lecture today. Starting with temperature. So cardinal temperatures is a range of temperatures for the growth of a given microbial species. We can find minimum, maximum, and optimum temperatures for the different species. The minimum temperature is the lowest temperature that permits a microbe's continued growth and metabolism. Below this temperature, its activities are limited, whereas the maximum temperature is the highest temperature in which growth and metabolism can proceed. If the temperature rises slightly above maximum, growth will stop, if the temperature continues to rise, enzymes and nucleic acid will become denatured or permanently inactivated and the cell will die. Optimum temperature is an intermediate temperature range between minimum and maximum. It promotes the fastest rate of growth and metabolism. Small chemical differences in bacterial membranes which affect their fluidity allow them to thrive at different temperatures. Now we can break down organisms into different groups based upon how they're adapted to temperatures. Starting with the psychrophiles, these are organisms that have an optimal temperature below 15 degrees Celsius, and they're capable of growth at zero degrees Celsius, or the temperature at which water freezes, and they cannot grow above 20 degrees Celsius. Psychotolerant grows slowly in the cold, but have an optimal temperature between 15 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. Mesophiles contain individual species that can grow from 10 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. Optimum growth temperature is between 20 and 40 degrees Celsius. And most human pathogens, which are mesophiles, grow between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. Makes sense, given that the human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Mesophiles are the majority of the medically significant microorganisms. Thermodiritic microbes survive short exposure to high temperatures, and they're common contaminants of heated or pasteurized foods. Thermophiles grow optimally at temperatures above 45 degrees Celsius. The general range of growth is from 45 to 80 degrees Celsius. And then extreme thermophiles or hyperthermophiles grow between 80 and 121 degrees Celsius. They live in soil and water associated with volcanic activity, compost piles, and habitats directly exposed to the sun. Out of the gases, oxygen has the greatest impact on microbial growth. Microbes fall into one of three categories. Those that use oxygen and can detoxify it, those that can neither use oxygen nor detoxify it, and those that do not use oxygen but can detoxify it. As oxygen enters into cellular reactions, it is transformed into several toxic products. Single oxygen, extremely reactive oxygen molecule produced both by living and non-living processes. It's produced by phagocytes to kill invading bacteria. Buildup of singlet oxygen and the oxidation of membrane lipids and other molecules can damage or destroy a cell. We also have superoxide ion, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radicals. These are destructive metabolic byproducts of oxygen. Cells use enzymes to scavenge and neutralize them. They use superoxide dismutase and catalase to get rid of these harmful products. There are different types of organisms based upon how they can or cannot use oxygen. Aerobes, or aerobic organisms, can use gases, oxygen, and its metabolism. They possess the enzymes needed to process toxic oxygen products. Obligate aerobes is an organism that cannot grow without oxygen. An example of something you're familiar with that's an obligate aerobe is yourself. Humans are obligate aerobes, we require oxygen. Then we have facultative anaerobes that does not require oxygen for its metabolism. It's capable of growth in the absence of oxygen, but when oxygen is present, it can do aerobic respiration. When oxygen is not present, it then uses anaerobic metabolism or fermentation. Microaerophiles does not grow at normal atmospheric concentrations of oxygen. They require a small amount of oxygen in its metabolism. They usually live in a habitat that provides a small amount of oxygen, but is not directly exposed to the atmosphere. 
Anaerobes or anaerobic microorganisms lack the metabolic enzyme systems for using oxygen and respiration. Strict or obligate anaerobes cannot tolerate free oxygen and will die in its presence. They live in highly reduced oxygen habitats such as deep muds, lakes, oceans, and soil. So here's some examples of the different organisms and how they react to oxygen and how they would grow in a particular media that the deeper down in the test tube you get, it prevents the penetration of oxygen. Obligate aerobes would grow near the top where they have access to oxygen that's required for their growth. Obligate anaerobes would grow near the bottom where they're away from oxygen because they cannot live in the presence of oxygen. Facultative anaerobes can use aerobic cellular respiration, but they can also use fermentation if they don't have oxygen. So they will grow near the top where the oxygen is present and use aerobic cellular respiration and they'll grow near the bottom where there is less oxygen and they can use fermentation. Aerotolerant anaerobes do not use oxygen for cellular respiration, but they can handle living in the presence of oxygen. So for them, they don't care where they're at within this test tube. Then the microaerophiles, they require a small amount of oxygen but not the high concentration that's present in the atmosphere. If you're working in a microbiology lab and you're working with anaerobic organisms, they can't handle the presence of oxygen, so we have to culture them in special containers or canisters that have no oxygen within them. Aerotolerant anaerobes do not utilize oxygen, but they can survive and grow to a limited extent in its presence. They're not harmed by oxygen because they possess alternative mechanisms for breaking down peroxides and superoxides. Okay, how about another gas, carbon dioxide? Capnophiles grow best at higher carbon dioxide tension than is normally present in the atmosphere. They're important in the isolation of some pathogens. Incubation is carried out in a carbon dioxide incubator that provides 3 to 10% carbon dioxide. pH can greatly affect the rate of microbial growth. pH is the degree of how acid or base-like a solution is. It's expressed on a scale from 0 to 14. pH of 7 is neutral. If you have absolutely pure water as a pH of seven, it's not an acid or a base. Numbers less than seven are acids. The closer to zero you get, the stronger the acid is. Numbers larger than seven are bases or alkaline. The closer to 14 you get, the stronger the base is. Most bacteria are neutrophiles, meaning they grow optimally at a pH within one or two pH units of a neutral pH of seven. The most familiar bacteria like E. coli, Staphylococcus, and Salmonella are neutrophiles and do not fare well at the acidic pHs of the stomach. Microorganisms that grow optimally at less than pH 5.5 are called acidophiles. For example, the sulfur oxidizing sulfur bus isolated from sulfur mud fields and hot springs in the Yellowstone National Park are extreme acidophiles. At the other end of the spectrum are alkalophiles or alkalinophiles. These are microorganisms that grow at pHs between 8 and 10.5. For example, the pathogenic agent of cholera grows best at the slightly basic pH of 8.0, and it can survive at pH values of 11, but is inactivated by the acid of the stomach. Osmotic pressure also affects living organisms. The osmophiles live in habitats with high solute concentration. Obligate halophiles require high concentrations of salt for growth, between 9 and 25% sodium chloride. They have significant modifications to their cell walls and membranes and will lice in hypotonic environment. Then you can have facultative halophiles, which are resistant to salt, even though they do not normally reside in high salt environments. Radiation can also affect microbial growth. Phototrophs use visible light rays as an energy source. Protective measures against radiation include yellow carotenoid pigments, which absorb and dismantle toxic oxygen. And other microbes use enzymes to overcome the damaging effects of UV radiation on DNA. Hydrostatic pressure also affects microbial growth. Barophiles are deep sea microbes that exist in pressures up to a thousand times atmospheric pressure. They are so strictly adapted to high pressures that they rupture when exposed to normal atmospheric pressure. How do we define the associations between organisms? Well, we can have organisms that are non-symbiotic, so they're free living and a relationship is not required between them or organisms that are symbiotic. They live in close relationship required by one or both members. If we further divide these among the symbiotic organisms, you can have a mutualism, which is where both organisms have a benefit, commensalism, in which one is benefited and the other is unaffected, or parasitism, in which one is benefited and the other is harmed. Among the non-symbiotic, you can have synergism, in which both are benefited, and antagonism in which one is unaffected and the other is harmed. 
So let's break this down. Symbiosis is a general term used to denote a situation in which two organisms live together in a close partnership. Mutualism exists when organisms live in an obligatory but mutually beneficial relationship. Commensalism is where the relationship benefits one member and not the other. The commensal receives the benefits and the co-inhabitant is neither harmed nor benefited. Parasitism involves a host which provides the parasitic microbe with nutrients and a habitat and multiplication of the parasite usually harms the host to some extent. So the parasite is benefited and the host is harmed. Then in the non-symbiotic associations, we have synergism. This is an interrelationship between two or more free living organisms that benefits both, but is not necessary for their survival. Antagonism arises when members in a community compete. One microbe secretes chemical substances into the surrounding environment that inhibit or destroy other microbes. Antibiosis is a form of antagonism the production of inhibitory compounds such as antibiotics. Speaking of synergism, we can have biofilm. Biofilms are mixed communities of different kinds of bacteria and other microbes. The pioneer colonizer initially attaches to a surface. Other microbes attach to the pioneer or to the polymer sugar and protein substances secreted by the pioneer. Quorum sensing, cells are stimulated to release chemicals as the population grows to monitor its size. Here's an example of a biofilm. The glycocalyx produced by a bacteria in a biofilm allows the cells to adhere to host tissues and to medical devices, such as the catheter surface shown here. So in the formation of the biofilm, first you have a reversible attachment of platonic cells. Then the first colonizers become irreversibly attached. Growth in cell division continues. Then you have production of extracellular polymeric substances and the formation of water channels. This is kind of the house of the biofilm that the bacteria live within. Finally, you have attachment of secondary colonizers and dispersion of microbes to new sites. All right, well, this video was an overview of the environmental factors that influence microbes. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.